There it is. Great. So um, welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, last week, we did have one session. So if you weren't able to attend that one, but you still want to get caught up, uh, it is posted in our interest group uh, website. Uh, today, we have um, quite a few more people. So that's great. Uh, hopefully, this will be uh, helpful to everybody here. Uh, Mark, if you're able to go to the next slide, I'll just go over the agenda really quick. Uh, so we just quick welcome here. We have an activity where we'll, we will allow you to see another different uh, tool that could be useful in this environment for your classes. We'll do a really quick uh, integrated design refresher, uh, but then thinking a little bit more about planning with your learners in mind in terms of how to potentially think about chunking material and then also how to collaborate online, which is a topic that's come up a lot in relation to smaller groups and how do we do that on online. So Mark, I'll throw it to you for our quick first activity here. Okay, folks, um, so we're, we're doing something similar today, uh, although albeit quite a bit uh, quicker than uh, we did last week in terms of uh, your capacity uh, or your, uh, your welcomeness to, uh, to, to submit some feedback. And this is using a tool called Mentimeter. Uh, there is actually a link embedded within the text, uh, the kind of clickable blue text there uh, near the top of the slide. I'm also going to post uh, a slightly smaller link um, in the chat for folks to click directly upon if they prefer that route. Uh, and actually what this, this will be uh, a singular question that you'll see upon clicking the link. Uh, you should not be prompted to log in in any fashion. This is an, an anonymous submission or an anonymous feedback tool. Uh, and I'm actually going to unshare our slides so that uh, I'll, I'll be able to display your responses. Uh, so uh, if it, uh, we will be showing the responses to the whole group, uh, so keep in mind that uh, if there's something personal there that you'd prefer not shared, uh, don't don't put it in. <clears throat> okay, so sharing a, a slightly different screen now. Yep, and that, that's no problem if you weren't able to make it last week. Uh, we'll certainly be doing our best to, uh, to reframe a lot of the ideas that, uh, that we discussed uh, previously. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, um, hopefully the movement forward in terms of uh, new options was uh, something that uh, was <laughs> attributable to your experience with us last week. And if not, we're still very happy to hear that that's been the case. Excellent. So Mark, can you tell us just from an instructor standpoint, you set up a Mentimeter account, you create the question, and then from there, you are able to give this link to your students. They go on, they click it in, and then you're able to control this on the other end to show the actual results. So again, something I've used in a number of conference presentations actually, and uh, I've noticed that it, it can be really useful in this kind of uh, format with students to just get a quick, how's it going, beginning of the class, or if you want them to respond to something a little bit bigger, you could give them a good 10 minutes to type in, a, in an answer. But then really what this is for is to really, uh, you know, stimulate some conversation with the students. So yeah, anything else to kind of add to that, Mark? Yeah, um, now certainly something like this is appropriate to our current context of uh, being um, in a sort of pivoted online um, methodology that we're in now. Uh, this sort of tool actually works very well uh, if, if we are able to be in a classroom with students again, uh, because it's it's available relatively easily using uh, mobile devices uh, through a, a somewhat memorable link that you're able to share with students. Uh, getting back to the the actual usage uh, and the logging in part of, of this tool, uh, an, an account with Mentimeter is needed. Uh, you're able to log in with your Google credentials. Uh, 
to uh, to use this tool. So so bear in mind, of course, that you are sharing with uh, with Google that you're now a user of Mentimeter, uh, and that does add to the the massive storehouse of information Google does have about all of us. Uh, but other other than that, it's a a fairly free to use, and we found um, very uh, very approachable and streamlined tool. Uh, and is really useful, I think, for giving uh, your audience an opportunity or your students an opportunity to uh, kind of perk up, uh, break away uh, for at least a moment uh, in terms of the the information transmission part of the course, so that they're able to offer some feedback or to to process a little bit of information. Well, cool. and there's a question from uh, Heather related to uh, the code. Is that the one we use? We always use, or is it unique each time you create a new question? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. It's uh, that code is unique to your presentation or question that you're asking your students. Um, so in a uh, in a scenario in which you're uh, asking multiple questions of your students uh, or across multiple um, lectures or seminar meetings and so forth, uh, it, it would be useful actually to perhaps ahead of time uh, generate a series of questions and have those codes ready to go uh, so that you're able to share them with students. Excellent, thank you. So then jumping back to our PowerPoint. Um, oh, I can see everybody before the screen comes up. Hi. <laughs> I was happy to have that experience as well. It's gone away. <laughs> awesome. Oops. So um, in terms of the, the flow, I just wanted to quickly uh, refresh your memory on what the roadmap looks like. So for the last week's session, we just did really kind of uh, high level intro so on the next slide there mark or I can flick forward mm -hmm. there we go um, so there was an overview and questions so that we could gather some insights into what people were really looking for in terms of uh, these sessions today we're focusing in on idea generation so giving you a little bit more of ideas and examples some lessons learned tips and tricks we brought an expert we have Danny here today to speak with us uh, and then following that, we'll also ask you if there's anything else you'd like us to address in the next few sessions, and we'll do that. So again, we have lots to cover today, and uh, hopefully we'll, well, we'll definitely make sure that we have time at the end of the session to um, answer any of your questions. So uh, going forward is uh, just what I said. We're going to hear a little bit from our experts. So Danny, I'm gonna hand it over to you to introduce yourself and all the great stuff that you've been uh, working on, sort of your lessons learned and tips and tricks. All right, thanks Madeline. Um, I, I'm gonna disavow expert right off the bat and say experienced, but I don't know about expert, um, but I did, um, I did have some good successes despite the the, the shift midterm last winter, and um, so that's what I'm going to talk about for a few minutes. And try and really, what I tried to do for today was just to think about um, both how I would normally plan a course, but also uh, um, the, the things that I took away that I had to change that's that provided satisfactory results. If that's a way to think about this. Um, what I did with the course, I've got a, an image there on the screen for you. It was a project based course. Uh, they built a website. Um, if you click on if you if you're interested, you can click on the, the slide and you can look at the website. Um, what they all you really need to see it from, from that is that it was a pretty sophisticated project. Um, they got a very good result, a result that was frankly better than I expected. Um, and Obviously, I'm very, very happy with that. So I just thought I'd talk about a few things that I experienced in the course that helped me and, and I've taken note of in terms of trying to plan this as a way to go forward, because I am trying to do something similar with this coming year as a similar project. Um, and of course, the problem with this kind of course is that it's it's a one off thing. Um, once it's done, there's no point in asking somebody else to do it. Uh, and I really wanted this to be a, a, a public facing project. That would be uh, that would be unique. So I got four things to talk about. They're really quite brief, but uh, hopefully they'll be useful for people. Um, the one thing that um, I found in terms of communicating with people was uh, we got really weary, and everybody knows this. Everybody's been doing this for the past several months with video conferences. Um, people get tired of screen presences real, real fast, um, and so I tried to introduce a, a variety of modes and forms of communication. Uh, and combining that with kind of uh, um, Julia and Madeline have been talking a lot about uh, chunking and how to think about breaking things up. And I did a lot of that in this course 
breaking them up into smaller groups. It was, a, it was a collaborative thing, but of course they were working in kind of smaller subgroups on different dimensions of the project. Some of them were doing the technical sides of it, some of them were doing the research side of it, some of them were writing, some of them were editing and so on. So I had them in little teams um, that they more or less set up themselves. But we spent a lot of time talking to each other in different ways. We talked to each other in, in Sakai-based forums. We talked to each other on text messages. We talked to each other on video conferences. Uh, there was just lots of things going on um, that way. And generally, the the whole thing there was uh, was that it was to get people, keep people, I should say, engaged, paying attention, as it were, um, and and not having that kind of oh god, here we go for another ridiculous uh, video session. And we did do a couple of those. I should say we did do a couple of those early in the process. And I could just see you know, this is something people have talked about a lot. It's harder to read a room in a video conference, um, but even here looking at the eyes and the wandering faces and the expressions, there was a clear sense of drift. And, and so I was battling that. Um, and I think by the end, um, people were still there and that was good. In fact, I think they were better towards the, end, towards the end than they were two or three weeks into this. So a variety of modes is, was one of my lessons from all of this and chunking and connecting that to chunking. Um, second thing was um, having said that, it was also had to be um, routinized. It had to be predictable. And, in some kind of fashion. So it wasn't just kind of chaotic, well, now kids, we're going to do this. Um, it was every week we had a kind of set of things and I was sending out kind of instructions, no, instructions is the wrong words, um, guidelines, I guess, to, to, to suggest who would be meeting these weeks and who and getting feedback from them on who needed to meet and who needed to talk and trying to set it up in terms of a pattern that they could see and understand and know when they needed to participate and how they needed to participate and so on. Um, and because they were all kind of working on their own things, that worked out really quite nicely because they were attuned to both the pattern, but also how they fit into that pattern. Um, the third thing that I've spent a lot of time thinking about in the past few weeks, and again, this is something that uh, Madeline and Julia have been talking about in, in earlier presentations, um, is this whole idea of presence um, and maintaining a presence. And, and it, this is kind of a conceptual thing, and I haven't certainly wrapped my head around it, but I am trying to push myself in in thinking of ways to maintain this effectively. Um, and so I've been looking at different things that you can and can't do. Um, certainly one of the things we, most of us in this session are looking at fourth year, so most of the courses will probably be synchronous or synchronous with some kind of asynchronous component. But even in that asynchronous component, just really, really basic things like, like staying on top of email, really being on top of email, responding quickly. and you know, I think all of us, or not all of us, many of us have in our syllabi, you know, you can't expect me to, to answer at Friday night at 10 o'clock. And, and you, know, you probably still shouldn't be expected to do that, but you should probably answer Saturday morning. Um, and you should probably be able to do those kinds of things. And if that sounds onerous, well, perhaps it is in some ways, but, um, but it is a way of letting them know that you're with them, that you're paying attention. Uh, and frankly, you know, it takes 15 or 20 minutes on Saturday morning to, to answer those emails. So I don't think it's a, a really big deal. I think it's also just useful for you to see um, when they're off doing their things that you can, that you're still part of that process with them, that they're not drifting off on their own. Um, so there's real limits to that, of course, um, and, and, and we shouldn't have build up excessive expectations, but we should certainly give them a sense that we're with them, we're working with them, and we're there to help them. In the more synchronous things, um, again, this kind of goes to the mix of forms and so on, but um, having a live form is, is a really, really good thing. Obviously, if you're having a synchronous course, that's part of what that is. But having live office hours, um, um, having, having sessions that are student-directed, student-led, where they're, where they're doing most of the talking, not you. Uh, these kind of situations, we, I, I think I'm certainly trying to avoid any situation where it's just me talking at them. Uh, which no good seminar should be doing anyhow, of course, face-to-face -face or vir virtual. But I think it's really important um, here that they are directing the show in some fashion. And there you can look at things like breaking them up into smaller groups and moving, you can move between those different groups. You can use teams to, to build subgroups within your class and so on. Um, there's lots of things you can do there. But you can also do other things. That I've, I've been, I'm teaching a spring course right now and I'm, teaching, I'm sending them uh, video comments every two or three days. And it's just me checking in and, and I really want them to see that we're in something together. We're working on something together. Um, and I, so I'm doing stupid things like talking about the weather and talking about things, just making them see that I'm, that I'm actually in their moment and you know, something, giving that, that live presence. Um, and I've been getting great feedback on that. They, they like that. They like that very much. Um, 
in conversation with a couple of people, I mean, maybe this was Julie was saying this last week, um, that uh, a lot of students are demanding to see student faces. Um, and in a synchronous class, you'll, you'll do some of that, obviously. Uh, but certainly in other situations where you're doing blended things, this is a way to augment that in, a, in some kind of fashion. The fourth and final thing I'm looking at, and this was kind of built into the course that I did here this past winter, um, but I'm really seeing how important it was to ultimately allowing it to succeed, um, is that the course has to be somehow made to be their own course. And in a project-based course, that's kind of obvious. Um, but I spent an awful lot of time both curating a project that they could do, but also allowing them the freedom to kind of go off and do it the way they wanted to do it. Um, and as happy, I'll say, you know, privately, as happy as I am with this is, you know, there's several things in this project that I sure as hell wouldn't have done and other things that I would have done. Um, but still, they did a fabulous project. They got a great outcome um, and they really took possession of this. And at the, you know, in the last two or three weeks that they were working on this, um, there was a real sense of enthusiasm, a real sense of engagement, a real sense of look at what we're doing. Um, and that's, that's really fabulous and, and really quite wonderful. And of course, the, the, the great thing is that this is not one of these stupid papers that will lie in the department office well past the term being over. This is something that they can continually point to and say, I was part of the team that did that. They can put these things on resumes and CVs and so on. So that sense of control, that sense of purpose, um, making the course their own, I think that's really, really critical. Um, and so if any way you can find to shift the onus, both in terms of seminar discussions, but also the broader vision of the course, and the, if, it, if it's not a project course, the broader vision of where you want to take that course, of allowing them to find that, allowing them to explore that, uh, that can be a really good thing and a really helpful thing. So that's my, I'm not sure if those are tricks and tips or not, but that's the, the kind of stuff that I've been thinking about as I plan for next year. Thank you. That was amazing. And I have to just put the disclaimer that, you know, we only sent Danny the uh, slide deck uh, about an hour ago. And I think everything that you talked about and you've obviously been thinking about are things that we are going to link into the discussion today, which I'm sitting here going, how did he do that? Like, these are the things we want to talk about too, which is fantastic. And I would also say that there's probably more than four things I would have taken from what you just discussed as a uh, kind of key things to think about as designing these uh, seminars. So, you know, the idea of student-led uh, activities, really key, right? The uh, pattern, presence, and purpose is really what I, I pulled from that as well. So um, before we move on, I'd love to uh, get some questions here, um, see if there is any. Uh, Barakat just said, uh, no, nope, the slide was just supposed to be there. It was just a, a background feature for you to see and you can click on it. And I was looking through the website, which is fantastic. Your students did such a fantastic job. They did. Any uh, questions? You're welcome to put your hand up or throw them in the chat. Can we require that students turn on camera? That's an interesting uh, question that um, you know, I would say if we think about who your learners are and thinking about where they're coming from in their worlds, uh, sometimes turning it on is not always uh, the best thing. So if they have kids running around or, you know, whatever that might look like might be a little bit distracting, but they can still somewhat engage. Um, we haven't come out on a stance around that. Um, thoughts on that, Danny, from your experience? Um. <laughs> I, I, we, we actually had a really brief conversation about this, and, and, and I didn't raise this, one of the students did. Um, it was really clear to me that at least two or three of them, and there was certainly a gender issue here, there was, it was more females than males, um, were, were just not comfortable doing that. Um, they, they, they felt on display in a way that they didn't want to be on display. Um, and, you know, an awful lot of people might say that you're on display when you're sitting in a seminar room. Um, but they certainly felt differently about it. Um, so, you know, I, I was totally whatever you want to do. Um, and, and it was clear to me too, I mean, obviously if the camera's not on, they can duck off and do whatever the hell they want. But on the other hand, it was clear to me that they weren't doing that, that, that they were still engaged, they're still talking, so, so whatever. 
And maybe it's, you know, providing that flexibility to the students to say, yeah, you can have it on or off. And, you know, it, it makes them it have some of that onus on them to be there, but also just allows them to decide, which I think in a fourth year definitely would be important. Now, Havina, I see that you have a question. Would you like to uh, unmute and uh, ask it? Thanks so much. Yeah, uh, thanks, Danny. I really enjoyed hearing about about your project. Um, just just a couple of quick basic questions. And the first one is, um, what what size were your groups? Um, what do you think the optimal group size would would be, or you know what what the size of your groups were? And also, I may have just missed this, but were you using Microsoft Teams um, for your groups? Just just um, you may have mentioned it, but I just thought I'd like to hear from you about that too. Um, Okay, so on, on optimal size, um, here I was here I was lucky. Um, for whatever reason, uh, um, I, I only had twelve students in the class, so that that kind of created its own optimality, if that's a word. Is that a word? I have no idea. Um, but it was certainly optimal. Um, and they broke up into smaller groups on a kind of ad hoc basis. Sometimes one or two people, sorry, one's another group, isn't it? But a little sub project where one person would do something, two or three people would do something, and they did that on a fairly ad hoc basis throughout the project. Um, but certainly there was probably three or four clusters of three or four people um, that were kind of consistently working together. And I think that you know, involved all kinds of other dynamics that, that I wasn't party to, but, um, but that worked really, really well. And again, it was allowing them to kind of figure that stuff out. I would prompt them and suggest maybe you guys ought to do that kind of stuff, but they were doing it as much themselves. Um, so that was really effective. I, I, certainly, I certainly wouldn't recommend you know, a kind of number that that you should do that. Uh, I think flexibility and paying attention to what needs to be done, and kind of encouraging them to think about that thing uh, is is really helpful and useful too. Um, and the uh, oh, teams, um, yes and no. They used teams for everything but what we're doing. They used teams for for collaborating, for file sharing, for um, for chats, for all kinds of things. Um, but as it happened, we had um, a mature student in the class who has a real job with a big company and they had, oh, Madeline, you'll have to help me here. It's the Cisco one, whatever that's called. Oh, you know? WebEx? That's it, yeah, they had WebEx, he had WebEx. Um, and WebEx is expensive, that's why we don't have it. But it, allow, it really allows that, I mean, Teams allows you to do this in some fashion too, but WebEx is really good at doing that kind of um, screen sharing of documents and working with, it really gives you that sense that you're working on a table um, rather than, pushing things around on the screen. Um, and the students liked that and it worked really quite well. Um, having said that, uh, <laughs> we don't have that and Teams would work fine for most other things. We just had a slightly slicker version of that. Um, so Teams, for, from my experience so far, with the exception of this moment of, of the, the video dimension of it, um, has worked fine in the, in the, in, as, a, as, a, as a resource base. Um, for them to utilize and, and and communicate in an asynchronous fashion. Excellent. Great, thanks, thanks so much. Appreciate that. Great. So uh, thank you again for the great presentation and great ideas. Uh, I'm probably going to go back to listen to the video again and pull out some of those things as some of the top tips that we're pulling from faculty at Brock, if that's OK with you. So thanks. And obviously, you're welcome to stay for the rest of our, our discussion here. So. Going to uh, the next slide there, Mark. Um, and there was a question from Heather about, uh, does Brock have a license for Zoom? And no, we don't. We have life size and we have Microsoft Teams. So those are the two platforms. Uh, Zoom, as you know, I probably know, there was some issues with privacy and that from way back when. I'm sure they fixed it, but Brock doesn't have that, um, that license at this time. So. Moving forward here, uh, we'll just talk a little bit about uh, what I think is an, an important piece. If you're on slide, what number is that, Mark? That is slide five. Slide five. Right. Um, so we talked a little bit about the context and the situational factors and really thinking about who are your learners, what uh, do you want them to know, what do you want them to be able to do and value. So we thought we would just kind of link in a little bit more around this uh, topic. Uh, I don't know if uh, Michelle Donnelly is here today, but she sent me a, a great reading that I really think frames a lot of the questions that have been coming up uh, across the, the faculty members. So on the next slide, you'll see that um, 
we want to be able to think about our learners and this came up in the etherpad a little bit is you know who are our learners and how do we design our course for them so we know that right now a lot of them especially in fourth year will be experiencing a little bit of a sense of loss of this ex university experience being on campus so we need to think about that uh, they're in a, again, a unique situation where they're maybe thinking and being a little bit stressed about the future, but still wanting to stay in the present, the present and really motivate themselves to continue to engage. Um, so that's really what you, it's important to think about in terms of who your, uh, who your students are and planning for that. So on the next slide, uh, this is what we brought up last week is still thinking through teaching activities, you're or thinking about what your learning goals are, and then what are the teaching activities that you would like to incorporate, and then feedback and assessment. And I'll go to the next slide there too, Mark, because we want to get to some of the, the good stuff at the end as well. So the next slide that speaks is slide eight. So this speaks to really what um, what you want to think about when you're designing uh, your, your courses and your activities. So thinking about it being predictable, and we just heard about that is, you know, do you creating a structured schedule for that week that stays consistent for the students? It has been demonstrated to be helpful in how the students are able to manage their own time and organize how they learn in an online environment. Also providing some level of flexibility, so ensuring all can engage regardless of where they're at. So that, that links back to our ideas of the asynchronous environment. So how do we create that in a way that they're able to engage? Connection, so this idea of presence, so fostering relationships, and we'll give you some ideas of, of that as well as empowerment. And that's one where, uh, you know, thinking about how the students create those assign assignments. And Danny, you spoke to it perfectly in saying that they came up with something that you might not have come up with yourself. And I love that when that happens with students. So how can we do that in this online environment as well? So what this might look like, I put together this table and it is a little bit small. So on the next slide there, it links to each of these pieces and learning activities that you could consider that uh, link back to all of these core aspects together with assessments and also some examples. So in terms of predictability is uh, having structured lessons the same way for each topic and each week that you would like them to be involved in that activity. You have clear guidance and then in terms of examples, you might have quizzes every week. You might have a rubrics that are very, so they are able to predict what they are supposed to be doing in their assignments. So those are some examples there. In terms of flexibility, this gets to the, uh, the idea of uh, synchronous material. So, and I say this, and I, I don't know if this is, uh, you know, just my experience in the last week, but my students in my MPH course, a number of them ask for, for uh, extensions because they work in public health or they're working in the hospital and there's certain things that they had to prioritize. And so I sat back and I said, you know, is, is that deadline my deadline or is it just an arbitrary one? Is it something that, you know, if I say, sure, have a few days, you know, it's, it's, it's okay. You know, pri you have to prioritize your education, but also they have other things going on. So does it really matter when it comes down to it? So uh, again, we have lots of schools of thought on this, but I think thinking about flexibility is, is important. Uh, in terms of examples, there are some people across the university that say you can have two days grace on any assignments at any point during the semester. So you can, if it's, say you have four assignments and one ass assignment you're gonna be late on, but you get it in two days after the due date, that's your two days of grace for the semester. So how can we provide some of that flexibility that allows the students to uh, complete their assessments and their assignments? The other thing to hear around flexibility is submission in multiple formats, if it's appropriate. So we know that we want them to be able to write and communicate in a written format, but maybe some students are really comfortable doing oral presentations. So if you have one essay, instead of having two essays, maybe you have an oral presentation and providing them with a bit of that option is something that can be helpful uh, for students as well. Connection. With connection, we 
obviously know in a fourth year uh, course, we want to be able to provide some level of synchronous engagement. So some learning activities, and we'll talk about breakout groups and how that might look in uh, online and what types of uh, formats you can use for that. But it might also be that you're looking at uh, a forum chat, but you do the chat within 24 hours as compared to like you have to be on and chat at this one hour because that might again not work for the flexibility for the students in their lives. So just again, that's a, a learning activity. Moving to assessments, thinking about grouping students based on the way that they can engage together. So if students say, yeah, we're these five students say, yep, we can all get together at 10 o'clock, uh, you know, Friday nights or no, probably not Friday nights, but Thursday nights and work on a project. And that's how they like to work. Maybe that's how they group together as compared to others who say we need to just be able to do it on our own time. So making sure we engage students and connect them in the ways that make sense for them. In terms of empowerment, this one is uh, the fact of providing students with some of that choice in terms of assignments that they might do. Just an example here, I know that there are some people that will have 80% of their grade is is created and it's non-negotiable, but then there's 20% that you have some parameters around it, but the students are able to, to create whatever they want to achieve those learning outcomes. And I think at a fourth year level, students come up with some really super creative things. I asked my students and they, uh, at one point, and they said, we'd love to do an advocacy presentation for our research topic. And I was like, I never would have thought of that. So the, again, that creativity, but still allows you to achieve the, the learning outcomes is, um, something that might be helpful in a fourth year class. On the next slide, and Danny said this as well, is thinking about ourselves as curators of knowledge. And this comes directly from the link that's uh, down there where a student was saying, you know, I didn't want to go to lecture anymore. I wanted to learn. I wanted to curate knowledge that from experts and think about it critically and communicate and collaborate and think creatively about this information instead of just being uh, a person who's having facts transmitted to them. Instead, the focus being, I will not be there to transmit facts, but to energize and teach my students to become active learners. And again, in a fourth year, I think that's what we all are trying to achieve. So thinking about pulling all those pieces together that allow you to understand or allow the students to understand and to gain those learning objectives that you're looking for is a, a nice way to think about how to pull your online course together. And on the next slide, I have uh, the focus on uh, chunking that material. So for this is, I, I sat there thinking, I'm like, okay, people are asking about, okay, how do you chunk material and what does that look like? And so I thought, okay, if I walk into a lecture, what am I doing? And so I, I will always introduce something. So I will introduce that, you know, what are we going to do today? Maybe don't think about it as today, but you're thinking about it to, in this lesson or in this week, as opposed to that three hour lecture block that you might have had. So what does that lecture content look like that you would normally sort of transmit to your students? And it might be that you would normally do a three hour lecture, but there might be some video, there might be some small group stuff, there might be some, they would be doing readings before they come to class in an ideal world. Uh, but also thinking about your, your lecture that might be again a two hour lecture, how can you break that up into some of the sections and make some videos to put into the online environment? So thinking about chunking it in that way, but then at the end of that lesson, thinking about how do we ensure they got it? And with that, I say is, you know, how do we have a, maybe a weekly forum so that you know that they're engaging? Uh, is there a quiz? Is there a, re a, a reflection? So something that keeps them there and uh, present within the course in that asynchronous way. So those are the pieces that I would see that you're putting in that asynchronous online environment. And then from there, you might say you might incorporate some of the synchronous. So the small groups, you might have uh, the group work, you might have student presentations. And we're going to talk to you a little bit about that next. And now I'm going to throw it over to Mark. I think. Yes. <laughs> uh, actually, but before uh, we we do move on, I wonder if there um, are any questions or uh, if any anything someone would like to vocalize or pop into the chat because uh, we, we certainly uh, I think gone through quite a number of, uh, of slides already and um, give you some breathing space okay 
uh, Brackett, you're, you're welcome to, uh, to unmute uh, your mic if you'd like to, uh, to ask a question. Yeah, I do actually. Um, it actually has to do with, can you hear me? Uh, you're a bit low, but yes. It has to do, okay, thank you. It has to do with uh, groups project, so breaking up into small groups. And what I usually, I do this in regular class. I'd like to do it in this online environment too. But in my mind, their group work should be not during class time, but outside of class time. And it's up to them when they meet and where they meet and how they meet and who leads it and who whatever. I, I leave this up to them. So is that not can it's, should be done also in this online environment like yeah should, absolutely well, i and need to actually facilitate we, this yeah and we we have uh two or three slides that are coming up that will show you how you might make that work in terms of a, a bit of a continuum so definitely something that i think is that would be the nice synchronous part, right? And that provides them with that connection into the course and the connection to the professor. And so we have a few slides on that for sure. And we'll show you how to do it. All right. Any other Thanks. questions? Uh, does anyone have experience with science courses? Uh, lots of content is most often presented how to de-emphasize this. Well, how to de-emphasize. So how to de-emphasize the actual just talking at students, I guess, is what you're thinking. So uh, I... It's Jeff Atkinson here. It was my question. Um, many of the very creative things that I'm hearing about group projects and um, asking students to do more of the, the active learning themselves, um, I must admit complete ignorance to how that could ever possibly work uh, at a fourth year level in a science class when, um, not to sound too pompous, but it's my decades of experience that has collated key points on topics that are supposed to be the learning objectives for the course. Um, how do I get away from just spilling that in a, in a traditional lecture format? Absolutely, and I guess uh, when and I should have mentioned this when I talked about the curator of knowledge, I guess that's bringing others expertise and readings and all of those pieces together. But also, as you're like you said, we have this expertise that we have as faculty members. And how do we bring that to the forefront outside of lecture? So I think with that piece, one thing that I do think works well in the asynchronous is if you're providing a reading, you also provide a bit of an upfront uh, overview of why you think this is an important reading from the experience that you have in terms of your work, how does this link together? So I think that's helpful in terms of, uh, you know, do you need like four or five minute uh, presentation to present about that work? Or can you provide a little bit of a written up, uh, upfront and then have them read it? and then reflect on it or answer a question in a forum. So I think that might be the shift that might be helpful in that scenario. But again, I know that's it, it's a hard shift <laughs> to think about okay. it. Thank you. No problem. And I have one more here just from, from Heather. If there's a three hour block set aside in scheduling, I know where this is going. Can you break times when group works together in different times within that other than the three hour block. I'm not sure if that makes sense. So, okay, so this is the fun part that we've been really dealing and working with uh, scheduling on is having those blocks that are set aside does mean that your students will have that time available. However, if it's a group project that you're asking them to work on, they can work on that at other times, but that three hours you could use that as a way to say okay you have this hour everybody has free if you need to do that kind of group work and so you could use that three hour block like that does that make sense heather hopefully <laughs> it's a it's been interesting because some people are still very adamant at using their block to go online and have the students come in and listen to them uh, but again that's a really difficult uh, way in which to teach in this environment and not overly uh, effective in a lot of ways, given what was also said about the tired of presence and being online and listening to things online. So 
Definitely great questions. All right, over to you, Mark. We'll go th quickly through the video stuff and we'll post that, but I think the uh, collaboration uh, slide will be really important. Uh, right, so so a, a little bit, uh, and this builds upon the notion of chunking content, uh, and in particular uh, content that is um, is video content in nature, uh, and this uh, in particular has to do with the the video that an instructor may wish to create at the um, at the beginning of a course, uh, at the beginning of a week, for example, to to help to frame the week uh, and the and the week's topic, or um, to create perhaps ahead of time um, as uh, a, really in a, to address the, the course's content itself. Uh, so this might be uh, a series of videos to address the weekly uh, or um, or monthly topic. Uh, there are uh, certainly lots of ways to present or share these videos to students that help to structure their consumption of those videos uh, and as well to inform perhaps the order in which they ought to do it and to allow uh, the the intermixing of other course content uh, throughout the um, the, the perusing or the consumption of of these instructional videos that have been created. Uh, our experience has been uh, working with a, a quite a great many instructors uh, to this point that there are there's some trepidation around creation of video for very understandable reasons. Uh, several points that uh, are certainly worth stressing are that uh, one especially in this context, advantage of video creation can be that it is a method for you to very quickly and effectively connect with students. Uh, and that can simply be to allow your students who are on the other side of Sakai or on the other side of Teams, uh, perhaps at a moment other than the moment that you've logged in to see that there, there is indeed a human um, involved with the delivery of this course. Uh, and as well, it, it's something that uh, on your side or on the side of an instructor is able to be created relatively approachably using uh, technologies that we now do have on hand. Uh, I, I do note at the bottom of this slide that uh, your your mobile phone in particular, if you've got something that was made within the last two to three years, is going to have uh, a very high powered camera uh, and a relatively good speaker on it uh, that is likely to be able to create uh, a, a decent enough quality video that is something you can share with your students that uh, again can be uh, useful for framing the upcoming week or to summarize the previous one to help students understand that you're keeping abreast of what's going on within the course uh, as well and i think more in line with the chunking uh, uh, discussion it, it, this second point of frequency and succinctness uh, it's helpful to think of weekly video lectures, not so much in terms of something that ought to be exactly an hour and a half or three hours in length, but more of having a focus on what is important for the learning outcomes of that particular week or topic. Uh, and as such, can perhaps be uh, made a little bit uh, smaller and more succinct. Uh, there are a series of maybe pot potential um, stoppages or distractions that might extend a lecture and that can include question period with students or the provision of examples uh, naturally when you're creating video or instructional video ahead of time uh, you don't have that opportunity immediately and are able to um, really just being alone with with your monitor or your camera uh, significantly focus your thought and and the message that that is coming forth in that video uh, and to I, I think associate with that thought that there are some um, I think very uh, there is some useful literature that that shows that students do have some difficulty really being focused on uh, on video content in particular beyond about an eight minute mark. Uh, so video that can be short in nature or perhaps that represents a few different breakpoints of what would have been an hour and a half lecture uh, can be very constructive for uh, your students. Um, uh, per, uh, uh, consumption of the lecture. I, I don't think that was the word I was particularly uh, happy to use, but that's the one. Uh, I won't present it now, but this video uh, that's linked at the bottom of this slide, you're welcome to click upon it now, of course, and then uh, have it as an open tab, uh, perhaps for later. Uh, and I'll note as well that we're sharing these slides. Uh, this is a great video. It, it's absolutely worth your time and uh, addresses uh, through the lens of, uh, of a member of faculty at Kansas State University, the creation of uh, lecture video in a very approachable manner. 
Uh, these are some available software or softwares uh, at Brock that we might suggest uh, for video creation if you do uh, intend to use your, your laptop or desktop computer. Uh, typically, if you're using your uh, mobile phone, none of these are even necessary, uh, although uh, it's difficult to present uh, a PowerPoint through your mobile device. Uh, so if, if, if you are considering uh, perhaps a more uh, comprehensive lecture, one of these softwares, in particular Universal Capture, you'll note has four check marks, um, is a helpful option and a freely available one at Brock that we're very happy to support. Uh, if you'd like to reach out to us at ed, uh, edtech at brocky.ca, that's E-D-T-E-C-H at brocky.ca, we'll, we'll link that at the end as well. Um, and uh, one of our colleagues was kind enough to um, offer uh, his relatively recently developed online course as an example of uh, some chunking strategies. And uh, before we we take a peek, uh, a, a fairly high level peek at what was done within that course, uh, I would note or ask you to um, uh, to be, I guess, thoughtful of how are the videos being displayed within that course? What's the strategy that's been used there? Uh, the weekly to do list was quite helpful and as well. Um, the assignments are displayed at strategic moments uh, throughout the structure of those weekly lessons or modules. Uh, so we're going to head over to that, and uh, for the moment, I'll I'll break my sharing of this PowerPoint. Oops, wrong screen. Apologies, folks. There we are. Uh, so this is an interactive arts and sciences course um, that uh, our colleague Mike Brousseau uh, created uh, uh, before the uh, the pandemic and before uh, any sort of knowledge of the grand pivot that we've been required to, uh, to make for fall. Uh, and this course was designed, uh, again, to be delivered entirely online and in an asynchronous um, modality. Uh, all of these lessons are created using the lessons tool within Sakai, which is uh, something that we are actually offering weekly workshops um, to to look more deeply at. Uh, there's a lot lot going on within lessons, so I don't think we'll be able to explore all of its details uh, exactly today. Um, but within the structure of each week, and in fact, we'll we'll jump right to module one. Uh, we'll note that uh, Mike has specified for his his students. Uh, oh, what the weekly tasks for the week ought to be has created a series of videos that are um, in, in very short order. Uh, you'll note that this one is, is about eight minutes long, the second about five. Uh, an exploration of, this, of the specific learning tasks of that week that students are able to watch on demand. Uh, and these are videos hosted privately within um, a very YouTube-like uh, video platform that Brock uh, makes use of and is embeddable within Sakai. Uh, embeddable meaning uh, simply uh, getting these uh, these windows into the videos uh, available from Sakai in context of the rest of the course. He's also made the uh, the PowerPoint slides available here a little bit further down. Uh, and as we pass by a few more videos, I'd like to note uh, a link to the week's assignment submission, uh, which again is useful and is provided uh, to students in context of the lesson um, as a whole. So if you've used the assignments tool within Sakai in the past, you'll um, perhaps have, have experienced that students are able to make digital submissions of their work. Uh, this, this is a link directly into the assignments tool, but it creates that link from inside the context of the rest of the week's content and helps students understand what the suggested structure of those learning activities might be uh, and perhaps can provide a uh, an, an automated sage on the stage in a way that may not be possible in a fully online environment. Okay, so we're, we'll head back to our... And I know we only have... Um... We only have almost 10 minutes-ish. Uh, so as we go through, we we did have um, 
There you go. This is a great slide. And we might not be able to demo exactly what this looks like, but Mark will walk you through this because I think this is something that everybody is quite interested in. Uh, it, right, and, and Danny addressed this somewhat as well, uh, the facilitation of small group discussion uh, and work and as well, um, the empowerment of students to have some leadership in those learning activities. Uh, something that is, is very worthwhile considering in your design of an online course. And I think we, we've had some questions in chat uh, around uh, really what, what the timing for something like this can be. Uh, I think to build upon that discussion, I, I, I would note that previous to an online environment, students often enough would take group work to a time that suited them rather than was completely aligned with uh, the course's seminars or lecture and so forth. Uh, so it's, it's, I think it's worthwhile maintaining that strategy in this environment. Uh, as far as uh, tools, uh, technologies that are available to facilitate that aspect of a course, uh, we've created what we hope is a, 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 a useful spectrum, uh, beginning on the left, of course, with what is what is easy to simply easy. Um, what what is more approachable to switch on and uh, just kind of run with in terms of your delivery of a course. Uh, there's a good chance that students will have uh, encountered at least the first few options uh, within this spectrum or this continuum. Uh, in particular, the forums tool within Sakai. Uh, often, students, in, especially in uh, in latter year courses, have experienced that tool uh, and that that solution uh, in the past, and will understand how to proceed. Uh, the Etherpads, uh, which is actually the tool that we used in our first weekly lecture, uh, our weekly meeting uh, to, to discuss uh, fourth year teaching, uh, is another option that is relatively approachable to just switch on, ask of your students a question, and then allow them to, to kind of move forward in that direction. Um, the middle option is interesting because it, it at some level allows students to choose their own adventure. Uh, by virtue of having that choice, students are likely to choose um, maybe not a WebEx option, as was the case in Danny's course, but something that um, a good number of members within a small group or a larger group uh, will have had some experience with. It's highly likely it'll be an online um, solution of some kind, perhaps a chat platform, uh, perhaps something that exists within um, our office environment here at Brock or just a Google Doc. And then the last two options uh, are solutions within our what's now an Office 365 environment that Brock has uh, has has lately kind of been enveloped in, um, with Teams being perhaps the most um, empowering from a student perspective uh, solution, but one that that may need some modeling on the instructor side. And what that could mean is helping students understand what they're empowered to do within a small group within teams. Uh, we've worked with a number of instructors uh, throughout these past terms to uh, explore these options. They're not perfect for all deliveries. And as well, if if this is something that you've not experienced or are comfortable uh, supporting within your course, uh, it's it's I think probably helpful to uh, think of your course in, uh, in terms of what is sustainable for you. Uh, we're, we're certainly aware that there are folks that have uh, additional responsibilities beyond teaching. Uh, and uh, I, re I recall within the, uh, the Etherpad that there, um, there was one note in particular about um, parental responsibilities uh, that are, are going to occur naturally across the teaching of uh, the forthcoming fall semester. Uh, so something that's sustainable on your side as a course instructor is also very important to consider. Uh, all of these uh, uh, solutions are uh, something that we're happy to explore in uh, far greater depth if you'd like to contact us uh, in CPI. Yeah, so one thing I just wanted to throw in there is if you look at the middle one, so students choose a solution amongst a group. And so that might be something where you're asking the students to create a group project and it doesn't have to be something that you're seeing or that you're engaged with as the instructor. They just go off, they make their own Google Doc, and maybe they create it that way. Whereas if you're, as the instructor, wanting to be able to see who's engaging, how they're collaborating, you want to actually jump in and be able to provide guidance on what they might be working on, then you might want to be looking more at the uh, Word online group documents or the team breakouts. So I think it depends on what you're trying to achieve 
achieve with the collaboration with the students and uh, being able to do that, depending on the level of that engagement, will depend on the solution that you actually choose. And Matt uh, has a question, or Matthew, sorry. Hi, thanks uh, for this. Can can you just clarify for me um, what Teams breakout is? Is that actually <clears> that you could take a group of, say, if I've got 20 students in a seminar, in a synchronous seminar, can I put, say, four or five of them into a, a subgroup that they can, say, work to discuss and solve a problem? Or is Teams breakout more of a text-based uh, grouping? Um, because I'd actually asked something about this, I don't know, in a session probably about five weeks ago and was told that at the time teams couldn't really do the, the synchronous subgroups. Um, is that changed? Mark, go ahead. Um, not a whole lot has changed within teams. It It's a bit labyrinthine, uh, the setup for um, that that structure um, that you've uh, described, Matthew, and that that actually is exactly what uh, what we envision um, and, and what has worked uh, with um, a little bit of deliberation and a little bit of, uh, I, I think, front loaded work on the part of um, either the course instructor um, or a, a course coordinator. Uh, but yes, um, at a really high level, Teams uh, is able to create a space for your, your course's delivery, just uh, in a sense, kind of like Sakai. Uh, everyone gets access to a default space, but uh, if you'd like to manually create additional ones that have some awareness of being private just to a group, uh, that's where this, uh, I think this strategy can really shine uh, because then as, as you suggest, uh, students amongst themselves have a space to share documents, to chat privately, uh, to collaborate on the same thing uh, together in a, a, a relatively, I think, future forward uh, solution. There's a a high probability that the next 10 years of a corporate environment is going to look a lot like what Teams is is serving up currently. So um, I know that we are getting to the end. We're <laughs> sorry, we maybe should have made this a little longer. But Mark, do you want to pull up the Teams? If for anybody that can stay, please stay. Yep. If you can't, um, what we'll do is obviously we'll have this videotaped and you can just jump to the end of the video and, and watch how we did this. We'll just show you quickly what that looks like and what the possibility is. Uh, if you're to do this more on the technical end and you're like, yeah, I got to do that, you'll link with Mark and he'll be able to uh, walk you through those steps. He walked me through it for my MPH course, and I think that's the one he's going to show here, which uh, it worked out really well. I think it's uh, the students, it was really quite easy for me to set up the groups, and uh, now we're just uh, getting them to work on their projects. So for my projects, what they had to do is come together, decide on a theory and a topic, and they have to put together a presentation, and they all have to present and videotape that presentation. And you can actually do that right here in Teams as well. So they will uh, be doing that in this space. So are you able to pull it up, Mark, or is it too weird with? Uh, teams? Nope, I should be able to. Uh, again, I'll be okay. I'll be breaking my current share though. So for a moment, we'll all be looking at each other. No <clears throat> Right, um, but Madeline, would you like to, uh, me to give a, a, a crack at it? Or would yeah, you like... sure, go ahead. Okay, <laughs> um, so this is um, the, the Teams site that, uh, that was created to facilitate, um, I guess, the synchronous lecture component of Madeline's course, uh, the, the MPH 5P14 course. Uh, we won't get too deep into the technical details of how it's made, um, but like Sakai, there's some awareness on the team's side of who your students are uh, and who you are as the course's instructor and uh, a space that automate, automatically is created with those two assumptions uh, is, is very available if, uh, if you'd like that done. Uh, and as well, your student roster or your student enrollment is maintained automatically. So if you, if you find that students, uh, and this of course is a natural component of courses, uh, uh, enrollment may ebb and flow as the first few weeks pass. Uh, students will be automatically removed and added to your uh, team's area if um, if enrollment does change. Uh, so as Sakai has tools along the left side, uh, the the team's space begins always with a, a general 
kind of chat area um, in which folks are uh, like Madeline, for example, are able to uh, type chats that the whole class is able to see. This is also a space where uh, the instructor or students are able to uh, create pop up video meetings, uh, a lot like our uh, video chat is today, but, but a little bit more in context of the course. Uh, but more interestingly, once we start dropping below the general chat area, we see that there are a couple of different other groups that were created. Uh, and I would note the little lock icon that's uh, associated with these three that, that I've actually got access to. Um, so these are private groups and these courses were created ahead of time uh, that there's not yet been any activity uh, within them. But uh, this is a space that only a number of students within the course have access to. Uh, are able to chat amongst themselves, uh, are able to use this particular icon here to actually have a pop up video chat meeting or uh, just an audio chat meeting uh, at uh, at particular times, obviously based on the group's choosing. Um, but interestingly, is an opportunity within this group one space to have access to a collaborative document that the entirety of, of the group is able to see and contribute to equally. Uh, so this is similar to the sharing of um, documents across email, of course, that are links to uh, a Word doc or a Google doc and so forth. Uh, that that strategy is, is now manifested in a small group environment within Teams. Uh, uh, our experience so far is that students may not initially have a complete grasp of all that's available to them here, so it, it might be useful to uh, in our case, we've created a presentation link atop the uh, the group one space so that it's something that students are able to uh, to click upon and, and get a better sense of uh, as well. Framing uh, the discussion uh, as Madeline has here has been handy. Um, OK, so just as a caveat, they, their assignment isn't due until August, so they haven't really started. <laughs> so um, but definitely something that I think will be helpful for the students because they can uh, add in documents, they can add in links for each other to check out. So it becomes that space that uh, provides that that kind of ability. Um, and now I just wanted to jump over. Sorry, uh, Jeff, I just missed your hand. That was up there. Uh, did you have another question for us? I did. It sort of uh, runs uh, right out of what Mark was just presenting. And speaking of, um, I'm getting suitably anxious about trying to orchestrate all this technology into a comprehensive learning experience. Um, can anyone, uh, yourselves or the other attendees, comment on if they've given courses like this in the past, how well students actually use the material and understand it and don't miss something? Yeah, so anybody is welcome to, um, to uh, jump in here, but I guess I have been teaching an, this online course for the last uh, three, four years now. Um, and I think from my perspective in the beginning, I tried to do extremely all asynchronous and, you know, just if they wanted to talk to me, they could. And I found I was very disconnected from the course as well as the students. Um, I never heard from them. I didn't feel like I was doing my job. I'll be completely honest. So as I was able to add in sort of synchronous things over time, uh, the students have appreciated it more. They've also been more engaged in activities that I've put out there as just to test your knowledge or just to engage in a forum and have discussions. And because of my presence, they're doing that even though there aren't marks associated with it. I was really nervous about using Teams, but it is really easy to set up in my opinion. From my perspective, I was able to go in, Mark showed me a few things, and then I was able to, to keep going. If you have this, I know as a small group uh, classes uh, uh, session, but if it was a big class, that's going to be more of a challenge, but I think we can, we can definitely work through that. So um, yeah, I, I don't know. I guess I'm, I'm always an optimist, but <laughs> maybe I'm not very helpful. <laughs> Thank you very much. Anybody else have any thoughts on that one? Uh, Excellent. I so I do, oh. I do. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> okay. So actually it's a continuation of this. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around this. I have a small class, but the small class can be up to 40 people. 
I divide them into smaller groups of, let's say, three people in a group. If I created, you know, 10 such groups and teams, is that something like with the idea that I would be part of those groups, that I would monitor what they're doing, that I would go in and, and guide them? Because that's not my intention. My intention is to give them a, an assignment, give them guidelines for the assignments, be there for them for any kinds of questions. I don't know how to do that yet online, but, um, but I don't want to be there as part of their discussion. Does that and make sense? Absolutely. And so I think that falls in that sort of middle continuum. So if it's not something that you feel like you need to monitor and be fully engaged in with this class, uh, then they, you might just tell them you can use Teams, you could use um, a Google Doc, you decide as a team, as a group, what what solution you would like to use to create the project. I think what is important for you to think about and for everyone to think about is what does that presence within the course still look like? So ensuring that, like you said, you're there for them. Do you put sign up times in, um, in your Sakai, they sign up for an appointment and then you meet with them here on uh, Microsoft Teams for, for a meeting with the students. And you could book it with all of them at one time if you wanted to talk about a group project. So again, I think it depends on what your desire is within that assignment or within that engagement with the students and then finding that right solution. Excellent. So I, I can see we're losing people, which is totally understandable uh, because it is after two. But I would like to thank everybody for coming and especially uh, Danny for being part of the conversation today, which just set it up beautifully. Uh, as Mark mentioned, uh, any uh, questions that you have, please send us an email to edtech at uh, brocku.ca and we will definitely get back to you. Uh, Caillou, I see a question there, so we'll stay on the line and answer that. Uh, but also, if there are any other ideas and things that you're really interested in understanding, if you want to put them in the chat and we'll make sure that we integrate that into our, our next uh, session next week. Great. Thanks, everyone. Uh, Caillou, I see that you have a question there. I'm just going to look at it. Did you look at it there, uh, Mark? Yeah, yeah, I've just responded, but I'm happy to uh, to vocalize that there. Um, we, we've there, there's been foretold a a, a work or a breakout group uh, feature coming in Teams. Uh, not sure if, when exactly that's going to be, uh, but for the moment we've found that it's helpful to leverage the the auto grouping features that are available in Sakai. Uh, Sakai and Teams will of course both have listings of your students. Um, and as well, it's helpful to have information in Sakai uh, because that's the location your students are likely to land when they first uh, join your course. Um, so in site info manage groups in Sakai, uh, one is able to automatically generate groups or use some other kind of um, of, of scheme to in, in inform group creation. Uh, once that list is made, then um, within teams one is automatically able to create them manually uh, so there's again there's there's no there's no automaticity there but uh, it's uh it, it, it it's it's still i think um a strategy that's in the works and perhaps that microsoft is just appreciating is uh is what we're looking for in higher ed excellent well, thank you, everyone. I'm just trying to pull back up that link for uh, copy the link and it down here. I think I've got the right one. So uh, there you go. Again, thanks and uh, everybody have a great day. Bye.